lead with their creativity. They generate purpose and meaning in their work, and they consistently drive business value. I'm Dr. Natalie Nixon, and I change lives with ideas. I'm a creativity strategist, the president of Figure Eight Thinking, a global keynote speaker, and the author of the award-winning book, The Creativity Leap. I advise leaders on transformation by applying wonder and rigor to amplify their business value. And I do that in two ways, through the lenses of creativity and foresight. Some of the questions that my clients have would be, what's the business that we should be in versus the business that we've been churning in? And how do we figure out our meaning and our purpose? There are two types of experiences I offer, keynote speaking and advisory services. I'm a global keynote speaker and I'm often hired by CHROs, chief strategy officers, and chief innovation officers, as well as event planners to deliver a keynote at your next event. I also offer strategic advisory sessions, both one-on-one -on -one, as well as Foresight Studios for your teams. Nothing makes me happier than when my clients get those aha moments where they self-identify as creative and they understand that creativity is actually the essential engine for innovation. That's the power of applying creativity, toggling between wonder and rigor to solve problems. I help you shift your paradigm to amplify your business value. Hi, welcome, welcome. I'm Natalie Nixon, and I am joined today for this installment of the Wonder Rigor podcast. Uh, I'm here today with John Lanius, who is a senior executive at the Nitrous Effect. And I believe John's other titles, he's the COO of GenieCast. And John's going to start by telling us a little bit more about what he does. But first, welcome, John. It's so great to have you with us today. Thanks for being here. Natalie, thank you. And by the way, that that opening video is actually really perfect. I mean, just to be transparent, we've had just a little bit of a conversation before, you know, we've arrived here today and everything that you are up to, everything you're doing is encapsulated in that video. And so you're just dynamic. You're fantastic. So it's an honor to be here. I'm grateful. Thank you. Well, I've known about Jeannie Cast for probably since I've started building Figure Eight Thinking about six years ago. Love your team. Can't wait to see all the ways that we will be working together in the future. And probably there are people who are joining us today who would love to understand more about what Nitrous Effect and GeniCast is all about. So first, share just a tidbit about your background because it's super interesting. We're going to dig into it further as we talk, but mm -hmm. a little bit about your background, how it got you to Nitrous Effect and GeniCast. Sure. So, so my background spans government, education, technology, and all media sectors. So in 2014, I joined the Nitrous Effect uh, first under Vidzu Media. And uh, I, I love to tell this story because the, the ownership group one day said to me, they said, do you know what Vidzu means? And I said, I don't know. You name the company. What does it mean to you? And the, and the individual said, video is a zoo. And I said, OK, well, not that I disagree with you, but what if the V stood for velocity? What if vid stood for video and what if zoo was a Japanese word that, that can describe telling a story through pictures? So we could be with velocity. We tell amazing stories through pictures. He goes, I like it. <laughs> right. So so in that moment, we became that. So when you talk about uh, understanding or knowing about GenieCast for the past six years, I was very much in that in that same boat. Like if you look at some of the historical literature around GenieCast, I was one of their first moderators. I was one of their first on camera talent. And then I had an opportunity over the years to do a little consulting with GenieCast. And then in October of 2021, I had an opportunity to come in as the chief operating officer. And when you talk about it's an extraordinary team, it really is. Because when you talk about, you know, before the pandemic, during the pandemic and after the pandemic, you know, there was this roller coaster of should everything be virtual? Should everything not be virtual? Well, what's been interesting about that is that, you know, obviously right now you and I are in a conversation. I'm in the Midwest. You're on the East Coast, but we're connecting in real time and we're having the intention is to have an impactful conversation that makes a difference for us and also the audience. And so that's the commitment of GenieCast is really through virtual experiences is able to touch, move and inspire an audience. And so I think about our work with Steve Wozniak. I think about our work with Simon Sinek or Ray Kurzweil, or Ray Kurzweil, excuse me. Uh, and then even Laverne Cox recently with L'Oreal. And so 
you know, now people are like, oh, the pandemic is over. You know, I want to be back being live. Well, if you want to be inclusive and you want to, you know, involve people of, of every capability and, and possibility, well, having a virtual component, number one, you'll save, you know, money by travel. Number two, you're, you're going to, you know, lower your carbon footprint instead of getting in an aircraft and, you know, traveling around the country. And then also, again, to the most important part is being inclusive and in, involving all people who want to be involved. And that is the overarching commitment of GeniCast. Yeah, you really, I think you summed up so, so well that you're really helping to make uh, virtual events more inclusive, more dynamic, and the technology has gotten so much better. The other thing I think it's really important in this reframe, in this hybrid working world of, of the value added of, of platforms like GenieCast is that when we, when we go in person in gatherings, then they become premium events, right? They become even more special because we have these opportunities to do these virtual events that are super dynamic. And you mentioned Steve Wozniak, Wozniak and, and Simon Sinek and others and Laverne Cox, amazing. Um, as well as, you know, it's 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 a it's a yes and it's it's a it's a plus one way to deliver really dynamic content and experiences for people. So yeah. thank you for that overview. And you know, you reference concepts like personal mastery. Mm -hmm. Why is personal mastery so important to you? What does it mean? Sure. And how is it relevant to the work that you do? Sure. So a little context for that. So when I was nine years old, I started studying two things, martial arts and world fragrance traditions. So beyond my nine to five executive work, uh, I give lectures and seminars on the power of fragrance. And so when I was 13 years old, I met my first incense teacher. And what I mean by that is that the Japanese tradition of incense is essentially 1400 years old. And, it, and it's called kodo, do meaning the way, ko meaning incense. And so for me as a leader, for people that are being authentic and, and, and they're really being who they are, they naturally transform a room. They're the people that when they walk into a room, you're like, whoa, who is that person, right? And so if you are not being your authentic self or you're being what I call the LA finger gunner, hey, listen, Natalie, it's going to be great. You know, we're going to do great work together. It's an authentic, <laughs> it, I mean, it might, it might make you laugh, right? But it doesn't really make a difference. And so what I'm pointing to is this, is that any of the, the Japanese refinement arts are called do arts, do meaning the way. And so personal mastery and also the mastery of, of those around you and really continuing to refine, to really look at what are your knowledge, skills and abilities and how can we build on those? You know, it's like no one in the world is going to understand everything about everything. And there are people who, who tout that they do. And so understanding where we are in a very natural place to begin with allows us to, to create a safe environment to be able to support each other, to become the best version of ourselves as well as our organizations. Well, um, I think that what you're talking about may have sat, seemed a bit woo woo. And even the work that I do, I talk a lot about intuition and, and the relevance of intuition and strategic decision making. Admittedly, people might have thought it was a bit woo woo 10 years ago. And what I think is what I'm experiencing in my work is that a, it never was woo-woo, and B, it is becoming increasingly relevant. And I want to know your theory about why you think it's becoming increasingly relevant. I'll, I'll share my theory. My theory about why the personal development dimension of ourselves, the authentic parts of ourselves of, of leading first with the heart and then with our intelligence and our IQ, why that blend is increasingly important is because of this fourth industrial revolution where technology is ubiquitous, where basic tasks are and will continue to be taken over by through automation and robotics. My theory is that while there's gonna be a lot of casualties in, that, in this reality, um, the opportunity and the great news is that there's more of a chance and opportunity for what makes us uni uniquely human to show up. Uh, what do you think about my theory? And do you have other theories? And also we have um, a couple of people who've joined us. I just want to welcome them. Uh, Jonayette, thank you for being here. And Ken Payne, thank you for being here. But what are your thoughts about why that those more personal interior dimensions of ourselves 
yeah. are being required in the workplace. So I'm very grateful to neuroscience who has quote unquote confirmed what the ancients have been saying for thousands of years. So if we look historically for a minute at, at a timeline, in the 1960s and 70s, we had the beginning of the human potential movement. We had programs like EST, we had program, you know, all these different things that started talking about consciousness. And, and you had affirmations where it's like, I'm a great person, I'm a great person, I'm a great person. Well, okay, great. You can say that all day long, but until you begin to merge speaking with action, nothing is ever going to happen. And so what we have been seeing since the 1960s and 70s is this continual refinement of the human potential movement. Ava, uh, Maslow is also included in that. Alan Watts is included in that, right? And so when we start to take a look at what's possible for us is that you know, we in, in America specifically, we have lost the tradition of the teacher student. Now, this has been replaced a little bit beginning in the 1990s with mentors. You know, who was my mentor? Right. Well, still at the end of the day, it's all about us and what we're doing. And so through sharing, through actually beginning to have a meaningful conversation with other people, do we start to alter our actions leading to the kinds of success that we want? And so, um, just to circle back to that for a moment, it's like neuroscience is, is very popular right now because, you know, it's proving these things in very short little snippets that we're able to, 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 to grab onto. And so I, I used to be very um, sensitive to, to sounding too woo-woo. It's like, you know, if, you, if you've seen some of my earlier interviews, I refer to this concept called shaman in a suit. And people are like, what do you mean shaman in a suit? Well, shaman- That's, by the way, that's a great phrase. I like it. <laughs> Well, and uh, that was on the Vance Crow podcast, and it's on my LinkedIn. You can look that up. It's a, it's a two-hour conversation that literally goes through all of these different places, but you'll find yourself in that, and and uh, it, it's it's been very beneficial for me and, and for others. But back to shaman in a suit for a moment. A shaman is responsible for the 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 gap or the or the line between the physical and the spirit world. Well, here's the deal. Every time that we have a thought in our head, you could argue that that is in spirit. I'm, I'm spiriting this thought. Well, I've got to bring it into reality. And the people that are able to bring their thoughts into reality, it equals power and not power over others. It's the ability to manifest. And so words like manifestation, where to your point in the 60s and the 70s felt kind of woo-woo. Well, your ability to manifest is directly relational to your success because we want to hire people that can create things. We want to hire people that their speaking is lined up with their reality. Said another way, integrity, being whole and complete. Where literally, if I take a, uh, a road bike, for example, and I try to ride a road bike down a mountain, well, that road bike is going to get destroyed in the process. The integrity of the road bike versus a mountain bike you know, is completely different. So I want to take the mountain bike down the hill. So if, for example, Natalie, you're, you're my mentor or, or, or vice versa, you and I are going to figure out what's going to be the best tool for what we're dealing with. And so for me, I think that all of this is coming together in the sense of that our speaking, our reality, all of this, call it woo-woo, call it whatever you want, but it is about effectiveness. Well, it is about effectiveness and platforms like GenieCast are mediums, they're me they're they're they are the platforms and the pathways to, as you said, align our speaking and our reality in a very authentic way. Of course, in person is a is an incredible way to do it. But yeah. even then, I, I I jokingly say that when people start to date, for example, it's Natalie's greatest hits, right? Top 20, right? It's, 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 are, we, are we really being authentic necessarily? So we still have opportunities to push through to authenticity. You got it a bit into one of my favorite pastimes, which is etymology. I love understanding the root meaning of words. And as you were talking about where, what, what a shaman truly is and the, and the etymology of that and, and mentoring and student, it reminded me of uh, one of the words in terms of the meaning and etymology that I love is discipline. Mm -hmm. Embedded in the word discipline is disciple. Mm -hmm. And a disciple is a student. So when we commit to being disciplined, focused, or in my practice and world, I call that rigor, 
we are actually committing to being learners and lifelong learners. So I just I just wanted to add that into the mix because I, I think it's it's also um, in some ways maybe tangentially kind of relevant to what you're talking about. Um, the next question, and then please ask me a question if you like after this question, but the next one I wanted to ask you, and it may be relevant to some of what you shared already, but you've referenced as well in different conversations you've had, the eye of the hurricane mm -hmm. and the imagery around eye of the hurricane. So mm -hmm. so why is that a relevant image to you and why is it important? And if it's, if it's also relevant to the work at GenieCast, please share that as well. Yeah, so it's, it's relevant to leadership and also personal effectiveness. So the a couple Japanese words that describe the eye of the hurricane, taifu no me or shikaku sometimes means dead angle. In other words, a place of safety. If you watch most people, most people are in the chaos of the hurricane, right? And when you're in the chaos of the hurricane, you know, you're dodging, you know, pieces of wood and pieces of metal that are coming at you and you, and that, that and you're not effective. And so, what, what the whole concept of Eye of the Hurricane is about is moving out of the chaos and into the center calm. And that is the embodiment of leadership completely, is that we have to be calm in order to then be able to move the hurricane to create a new path. And we can't do it when we're inside of it. We have to do it when we are in the center of the Eye of the Hurricane, the Typhoon Nome. And, and so when you're inside of that, of that, of that eye, the pressure's really, really high. Same thing with being a leader. You know, some people make joke, oh, there's a target on me, I'm the leader, you know, things like that. Well, here's the deal. If we are looking at where we are suffering, where we are in chaos, and we're starting to support each other about where is your eye of the hurricane, and it's different for everybody. You know, some people have lots of children. Some people don't. Some people have lots of family responsibilities with a, a loved one who, who may be passing away. We forget that we are all in the human experience, regardless of how we look, what our preferences are, any of that. And so because we are in the human experience, we're able to connect with people. But oftentimes when we're in the thick of it, we think we're the only person in the world who's ever experienced it. And so by beginning to share, Natalie, let me share with you for a moment, right? In a conversation, in a true conversation, there's only two things that are ever going on. One, in a conversation, I want to elevate my joy. Hey, guess what, Natalie? Yesterday, some, someone really famous is going to write the forward for my new book. That's one aspect. The other aspect is reducing my pain. Natalie, you know, so you know my mom, she's she's passing away and I'd really love for you to maybe support me. Maybe you can, you know, uh, maybe grab lunch for me. And so it, what's interesting about that is that different from a speech, when we are in conversation, only those two things are going on. And when you start to actually hear conversations that way, the person is telling you, I'm sharing my joy with you. I want to reduce my pain. And so then we are immediately connected instead of things that can separate us, which I don't need to go into, but politics and, you know, all that other um, junk, <laughs> to, to be quite blunt. So, so, John, how does one move, in, in, and I know this is the entire course, but just if you give one example, how does one move from the chaos realm to that core realm? What's, what's yeah. one way one can do that? Is it through that deep, meaningful conversation, but what's the the pathway to, yeah. to more of the calm. So the easiest way to do that, and I'm, I, I'm also a hypnotherapist, so I'll work with different, I'll work with executives and leaders and really looking at where the goals are. And so one of the first ways to move out of chaos is to, is to realize where do you wanna be? What is the intended outcome, right? For me, under, under everything, I operate from a commitment, which is that I stand for the enlightenment of all people. And again, not to sound woo-woo, but I stand for the realization of whatever anybody else wants to have. And so if you write down your goals and then all of a sudden you notice that Natalie Nixon, you know, embodies some of that, I might want to have a conversation with Nat Natalie. How did you do that? And what's interesting is that anything that you've achieved, if I can imagine it in my world, then I can begin to achieve it. And because you, to use Japanese words for a minute, you, you're my senpai, you have, you, you're my senior. I could say sensei, one who came before, right? That those are the meanings. But by you engaging with me and showing me, don't step there, step here, don't step there, step here. I'm going to move that much faster 
to the kind of goal, uh, to the kind of realizations that are that are you know pertinent to my goals, and that's the fastest way to do it. Well, one of the things I'm hearing from your example of how we move from the chaos to maybe that that centering realm is we can't do it alone. We have to ask for help. We have to be open to where our teachers may be, where our guides may be. Um, and I think for leaders especially, which it, it's very real, but it can, it can feel pretty lonely. There's there's a lot of that you are, as you've already mentioned, you feel that eyes are constantly on you. To be able to humble yourself, to ask for help, to admit that you don't know, that's the transparency that we know is, is abounding in servant, the servant leadership model and a lot of what I talk about in inquiry-based leadership to be able to lead with questions. One of the things that your eye of the hurricane imagery reminded me of in terms of you and I increasingly have more and more of a Venn diagram going on here in our work, but <laughs> I, I'm grounded, my work is grounded in something called chaotic systems thinking, which is not chaos theory, it's rooted, it's, it's connected to chaos theory, but a chaord is a word that Hock made up. Hock was the first president of Visa, the credit card company, and when he was tasked with leading Visa, he wanted to figure out a way to lead an organization in a way that he saw that nature was designed. And so in nature, we see that there's chaos, mm -hmm. which is not anarchy. Chaos is randomness. Mm -hmm. But there's also order in nature. And order is not control. Order is, is structure. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's rules. And we need both. So you, anyone who knows about the way I define creativity as toggling between wonder and rigor to solve problems, you, you get a sense of where I was inspired. So when you were talking about the eye of the hurricane, the chaos realm, that, that centering piece, it, there, there's a bit of overlap. There's that, that was just super interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, you said I could, I get to ask you a question. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, that opening video that talks a lot about you, right? I, I could watch that and get a very good assessment about who you are, but here's what I'm curious about. What's something about yourself that you enjoy sharing with others, but often don't have the opportunity? I'd love to hear that now. That would be dancing. Absolutely dancing. I, I reference how I love to dance. Mm -hmm. I refer, I've referenced how I'm a clumsy student of ballroom dance. <laughs> and to take it a step further and to actually be able to dance with some of the people with whom I work would be pure joy. It would be silly. It would be fun. It would be energizing. And I think people would see a, another dimension of me. Anyone who uh, is my friend, part of my family, knows that I will shut down the party. I love to dance. And I actually did an experiment at a board meeting uh, in March. I, I'm the outgoing chair of this board and I decided to lead a lesson in the bachata. So the bachata uh, is a dance that stems from the Dominican Republic. It was actually the dance of the brothels uh, mm -hmm. way, way back in the day. But it's a very, uh, it's, it's not as simple as the merengue, which was a bit like a marching dance and moving your hips. It's simpler than the salsa, which can get quite intricate. So it's a fun dance for people to get into. And we um, talked about, you and I, John, talked about interoception and proprioception. We talked about that and our awareness of, of where we are in our bodies to be present and where we are in space. And dancers are outstanding at both interoception and proprioception. And I taught them the basic steps of the bachata. And they had so much fun. I had fun. And we referenced it throughout the rest of the board retreat. So um, that would be high on my list of something I'd love to share more regularly with people with whom I work. Love that. Thanks for sharing that. Absolutely. Let me see if we have any questions. Yes, Gitanjali. Gera, I know Gitanjali. Hi, Gitanjali. So happy that you're with us today. And so this is Gitanjali's question. She's like, she's enjoying this conversation. So John, you mentioned that the way you work with people is that you have the goal as the anchor. Mm -hmm. What if the group isn't clear about the goal? How do you then move from the chaos to the core? Excellent question, Gitanjali. Perfect. So about 25 years ago, I invented a concept 
called a forward meeting. So many companies will do something called a retreat, right? And the idea is we're retreating back to go forward. Now, the Tao Te Ching will talk about how the path forward seems to go back. So that's important. But a forward conversation with, with a company is all about how are you going to continue to move the conversation forward? So on my LinkedIn, one of my articles there is called The Company Forward, Where Trust is Everything. I, I invite you to read it. But inside of that, the one of the prerequisites for that course is creating a leadership declaration. And what that is, is that John Lanius, here are my, here are my core principles, and then here is what I'm committed to. Now, a leadership declaration can change at any moment, but what it does is that it allows people to go beyond anything that they could be opposed to. In other words, if I, Natalie, if I tell you that I'm committed, I stand for the enlightenment of all people, is there anything in that that you can negate necessarily? No. No. Because, yeah. So, it, so if a nine year old doesn't know how to tie their shoe and I teach the nine year old to tie their shoe, they're enlightened to tying their shoe. If someone comes to me and says, how do you do sales where you're not salesy? Well, it's all about connection. And then how do we do that, right? We can talk about calibrated questions. We can talk about, you know, leading with the opportunity. We can talk about these different things. And so the way that I, and this all relates to your earlier questions, is that applying all of the, the things that we have to deal with in the course of a day inside of leadership declarations, inside of what we're committed to, the organization moves that much faster to the goals that we set out. So the last point I'll make about this is that ultimately, at the end of the day, there's my view. Natalie, there's your view. And if we as an organization will always align on our view, then we will always be much better because you can continue to contribute to that. I can continue to contribute to the our view. And the more people you have, the more dynamic it becomes. It's like a soup, right? It's not a thin soup. It's got, it's got vegetables and, and chicken and whatever else you, you want to add to it so that it becomes nourishing and it becomes deep. So some more woo-woo for you. <laughs> no, no, it's not really. Thank you for that awesome question, Gitanjali. And it's, it's like a thin soup. It's like a stir fry. It gets more vibrant more nutritious mm -hmm. uh, and, and what you're talking about requires us to both humble ourselves to relinquish only forging our point of view ahead which yep. requires humility and the stance to lean in with curiosity to inquire what other people's perspectives and thoughts are which we can all get better at with practice this, these are all things that that we can get much better at price. Oh, and my, my, my production manager, Morgan Wells is amazing. She's added the link in the comments to John Lanius's article, The Company Forward, which he just referenced. So make sure you check out his article. We have to wind down, John. I have, I have two questions I wanna ask you to finalize. The first is, you've mentioned your long lifelong learning and practice as I'm going to call you an incense fragrance guru. You may have a different term, but you teach the idea of listening to incense or listening to fragrance. Mm -hmm. What exactly does that mean? Yeah. And how does it relate to business and leadership? And then I have yeah. one final question. Sure. So when you think about incense or, or smelling incense, in, in the Asian world, it's actually considered a, a little uncouth. So we want to listen to incense in the same way that we listen to someone's fragrance. So if I'm, when I hire someone, one of the first things I will do is I'll ask them, I'll say, look, normally in an interview, you're going to put your presenting self on. Hey, I'm John Lanius. Look, I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. Go ahead and hire me. Well, that's not authentic, right? So what I will ask people is our questions like, you know, tell me about you when you're outside of work, you know, what's something about you that you don't get to share very often? What that does is that that begins to lower those, those parts of ourselves that we, that we guard from, from other people. And so the whole concept of listening to incense is, a, again, about a thousand years old. But what it's about is about it's listening for instead of listening to. So if I pick up, if, if, if I pick up a rose that's fragrant and I, and I smell it, right, I listen to it, what is it communicating to me? And so how we apply that in leadership and how we apply that as a group, what is the essence of Natalie? And how can we utilize that within our organization authentically? 
Because if you're operating on top of a fake way of being, it's like dating and not being authentic. And the person falls in love with this fake you. And three months down the road, you'd be like, ah, I got her. And I'm going to just put on my, you know, my, my dirty shirt and just be someone different. Well, that's wasted time. It's wasted energy. If you're you and you're really you and the other person is them and really them, you can have quality and deep conversations that are truly connective and not just, I just got to deal with Natalie. And that's a lot of, that's the way a lot of people are at work. Well, I am literally surrounded by the fragrance of these incredible <laughs> peonies from our it. garden. Yeah. I, I try not to have favorites in life. Oops, let me correct this. I try not to have favorites in life, but I have to say, that peonies are my absolute favorite flower. And I a light bulb just went off in my mind when you just talked about um, essence and fragrance. Literally, when we are able to smell someone's true scent, be mm -hmm. that body odor or the mm -hmm. scent of a plant, um, mm -hmm. that's the core of the person. Yep. So that's why, we, uh, why I'm understanding that we can say we are listening for mm -hmm when we're smelling, because we're actually getting to the essence. Okay, we have to wrap up. Thank you so much to everyone who joined. Oh, you wanted to say one more thing. Just, just 10 more seconds. Uh, on my LinkedIn, there's an article called The Scent of Peak Performance. So you can go deeper with that. And then the last thing I'll share when you talk about getting someone's essence is that um, we will pick our partners, yes, by how they look, but also by how they smell. And so Harvard did a, did a report recently where they found that birth control actually changes the fragrance of a woman. And so the idea here is that what if we're connecting with people with different scent signatures that could relate to things that are far, far, I, the you know, impact of that could, could be far reaching in society. So happy to, you know, uh, to, to continue the discussion. Natalie, thank you so much for the time today. Thank you. You are so welcome. Can you say in like 30 seconds, I think I might know the answer, how you try to bring in more wonder and how you try to bring more rigor into your work. And then we will bid adieu. Yeah. So I, I would say this is that the wonder and the rigor really is having people share their leadership declaration, because because by doing that, you'll understand who they are at their center heart. The Japanese word is mokoto, meaning sincerity of heart. And then by having people listen for their leadership declaration, who they say they're a leader, natural rigor occurs. Amazing. Thank you so much, John. Thank you to my producer, Morgan Wells, who's been essential in essence of this work. Thank you for everyone who joined. Both of John's articles that he referenced are in the comments. Please make sure you connect with John and make sure you check out GenieCast. And thank you so much for joining us today. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.